This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so Chris and I decided to title today's webinar, Helping Clients to Stay Balanced During Times of Uncertainty. And it's not just because all of us have been living history in the last four months, learning how to survive and thrive during a pandemic, because times of uncertainty happen at any age and many different phases of the aging process. So our goal today is to bring people together and learn how we can all work as a team in a supportive environment for the many different types of clients and patients that we all serve. So I think everybody will agree that feeling balanced at any stage in our life is really important because when we don't feel balanced, we feel unstable, we feel as if something in the big picture is not fitting in, it's not working. And so it's important that we balance the multi-dimensional facets of our lives, the legal, the medical, the financial, the social. So when Chris and I were planning the webinar, we thought, what is a great way to share information and learn from other piece, people's examples <clears throat> So we decided to present to you two case studies that will show you two very different contrasting examples and that will lead us to a discussion later on about how to properly plan so we can try to avoid crisis situations. So our first case study is entitled The Absence of an Incapacity Plan. And this was a mutual client that Chris and I work with. Uh, it's actually the client's son who is unmarried and in his early 40s. He has a history of drug addiction that plays a very strong role in why we were brought in by the father. He was self-employed, had his own business, was living with his father in his father's home. And from being self-employed, he was able to obtain private health insurance with a very good, solid, reputable health insurance company. But one day uh, in May of 2019, he was in his bedroom in his father's home and he ended up overdosing on illegal drugs. And unfortunately, that experience left him in what most medical professionals would call a persistent vegetative state, meaning he really is not able to interact or respond with his environment. He cannot speak by mouth. He cannot use his hands to use sign language. He cannot write. So he went from a hospital setting initially to a rehab, to a nursing home, to Kindred Hospital, and now is currently back at his father's home. When his father first came to me, the first thing I asked was whether the son had any legal documents that would give the father or anyone else in the family permission to make his medical as well as his financial decisions. And unfortunately, the answer was no. This young man, like many young individuals, do not see the importance of having legal documents such as a durable power of attorney or a designation of healthcare surrogate. This made it very challenging for his father to make any kind of medical or financial decision for him. He has been very fortunate in that all the different medical settings have allowed the father to be recognized as what Florida calls a healthcare proxy, which is a law that allows people to fall back on 
before they are put in a situation where they must go to court and petition to become a guardian. So in that regard, our mutual client has been very fortunate to be permitted to make his son's medical choices, but that could have stopped at any stage in their story. So at this time, I would like to have Chris join in with me to talk about her perspective of her work with this client. Mm -hmm. So um, when Stephanie first contacted me, um, she, in addition to what she just mentioned, from her point of view, there were no documents, there was nothing in writing, and it was a very unfortunate situation. And she asked me to meet with the father because she felt that he was overwhelmed, um, very conflicted about what was the best plan for his son, um, and was also rather withholding of certain information that would have made it easier to sort of understand what options were available and what did he really want. Um, and I, so I did meet with him. It was, it was just before, I think it was just as COVID was starting to um, take hold of all of us. And I was able to meet with the father and we met over at Westside Regional Hospital and I did meet the son. And as, as um, Stephanie is saying, there was no communication with the son, but what I learned in talking to the dad was that from a, psychosocial point of view, this was a very conflicted father who was overwhelmed with guilt over many early in life issues that he had with this young man. He felt that he had neglected this young man when he was a child, that he had um, left this young man, his son, in a situation where another man had abused him. So the client, our client, felt very conflicted about not wanting to give up on his son. Um, he ignored all of the prognosis that he got from different doctors. Um, many people wanted to put the son on hospice. They felt that there really was no hope for his recovery. And the father refused to put him on hospice and just continued to believe that somehow through the power of prayer, through his own hope that he was going to come back to him, that the son was going to somehow recover to a certain degree. And the father just said, I, I cannot accept any plan that, that um, would reduce him to being on hospice or would place him sort of in a, in a nursing home where he would be neglected. He had a very negative connotation and feeling about placement in a facility. Um, and he wanted to be present continuously every day to monitor how he was doing. Um, he was very withholding also about finances. We, we, we didn't know what, was there any money? Uh, let, you know, Stephanie got into that more with him, but as a social worker, when you're presented with, you, you know, here's the son who needs total care, ongoing basis. We don't know really how long he's going to remain that way, but he could remain with good care. He could remain in a vegetative state for a very long time. We have a father that doesn't want to consider hospice and wants everything done to keep him alive and to keep him going because in his mind, the son is going to actually recover one day. And the father was extremely um, secretive in my opinion, about um, what was he willing to do? How far was he as a parent willing to go? Um, was he going to take this young man home? You know, what, what was the plan? And very shortly after that conversation, which I shared with Stephanie, everybody went into lockdown and the father was unable to continue to visit the son in the hospital. So his anxiety increased and my contact with him began to be only over the phone. And it, it involved trying to research where was this young man going to wind up and what was going to be acceptable for him. And also what was going to, what was going to meet the son's needs, but be acceptable for the father. And now the father was prevented from going and looking at any facility and saying, that's the one I want. And 
So it, it, it turned into a very long drawn out process, but concurrently to that, Stephanie began a process of applying for Medicaid. And, and initially it was gonna be institutional Medicaid for the son because the dad was basically saying he had no assets that was gonna be able to pay for care for his son after the insurance ran out. And Steph, you wanna talk about the Medicaid process? And basically we, she and I worked together, we, we shared information because his future and how we were going to guide the father and, and counsel the dad as to what his options were and what were the possibilities came down to what he wanted emotionally for his child and what he was his son was entitled to in terms of benefits. Thank you, Chris. So I do want to clarify for everybody that people do not have to have a durable power of attorney in order for someone else to apply for Medicaid on their behalf. That, that is permitted. But where it could have become more of an issue with this family is had the son had assets in his name. Now it turned out he had a very small bank account that the dad was on, but no other assets to speak of. So we did our best to do an investigation with the father's assistance just to make sure that we were properly reporting assets and income to the Department of Children and Families on the application. Now, there was um, a little bit of a surprise that we found out after the governor closed the state in March, which made it that much difficult to communicate with the father. During a phone call, I learned that the father a year ago had purchased a piece of real estate in the middle of the state in his name, no issue there, but became concerned months later that the rental income might impact his ability to continue to receive Social Security retirement benefits. So rather than going and getting qualified legal advice from an elder law or a social security lawyer, he went to a real estate attorney and had his son's name added to the deed so that he could direct the rental income to the son. Now, this was not something that was disclosed when I initially met the client in January pre-quarantine. So finding this out after the quarantine did create the challenge because we couldn't physically meet with the client anymore. The client, the office was closed. The client had a very limited ability to use technology. And so he was literally mailing documents relating to this real estate to the office. And as some of you might remember, it took a very long time for mail just to get through the system. So that became our new challenge in the process of applying for Medicaid. I then learned that in the fall of 2019, he went back to the same real estate attorney and took his son's name off the deed. Now, my concern was that DCF might view this as a transfer of assets, which would cause his son to be delayed in being approved for Medicaid. So how we presented it to DCF was to be completely transparent, divulge the existence of these transactions, but explain that the client proceeded under a misunderstanding and that in fact, the rental income never would have impacted his ability to receive his social security retirement benefit. And thank goodness for his son's sake that DCF did accept this explanation. They did not view it as a transfer of assets belonging to the son. And about a week ago, we did receive the notice of approval from DCF. So it's had a positive end result, um, but through a very challenging period of time. 
And, and, what, and I will add as a postscript is that um, ultimately the son wound up for a second time at Kindred. Um, they, they cared for him as long as they could under his insurance. And then they made it quite clear that he'd have to leave. He'd have to go to uh, either go home or go to another facility. Um, and so a lot of my work at that point became helping the father make a decision. And the decision he made was to bring his son home. And it was the first concrete step in the right direction. Um, I don't think he quite realized what he was getting into by bringing his son home, but he was not going to put him in a nursing home. And so I worked on getting um, uh, a, a medical oversight at home. We, we found a, a, you know, a physician company that made in-home visits. Um, he did get some nursing visits under insurance. We found an agency. We you know, did a lot of calling of agencies. The father was shopping price. He was not shopping competency of caregivers. So he ran through a lot of caregivers, even though he was only paying very little. I, and I, I just kept saying, you get what you pay for. Um, he didn't really want me as a care manager. He wanted to try to do everything himself, but was calling me continuously. So we did decide um, that I would stay on board with him until things stabilized. And the son did come home. There were a lot of sleepless nights. Um, he did finally wind up with some private caregivers. Um, and I just heard from him this week that he wanted to speak to me again. So, um, you know, part of my issue once the son was at home was anticipating hurricane season. This is a young man that's dependent on equipment to be alive. So we had to work out many details after he got home. And uh, it's quite possible that we'll continue to work with him. But I think that if we go back to what the title of this case study was, there was no plan. This was a father that um, was so consumed with his own emotional feelings about the son. Um, and like many parents, he never had a conversation with the son. I don't even though, think that the father has his own advanced directive. So this was a family that never saw the purpose or the need to talk about all the what if scenarios. And yet it turned into something that, you know, um, Stephanie and I did collaborate on to the best of our ability. Um, and it's, you know, for them, for the father and the son, this is an ongoing situation um, that they will be involved with, you know, until the son passes away. So um, so I think some of the takeaways from this case study are, first of all, that we do want to emphasize to people we come in contact with, whether they're our neighbors, people at our club that maybe we play golf or tennis with, or that we attend church or synagogue with, is just how important the underlying legal documents become in a time of crisis or a time where something totally unexpected, completely unforeseen occurs, that it can allow things to proceed more smoothly. People can maintain their privacy and their confidentiality as opposed to losing their privacy if we have to go to court to do a guardianship. And I think a very important takeaway brings into the, the picture that when we work together as a team, it's important to explain to people the importance of good financial planning. You know, Scott, when he did his introduction, mentioned that one of the things he suggests people consider is long-term care insurance. And that many times needs to be part of the big picture of the plan. And you're never too young to consider having that as part of your portfolio so that it allows you options that might be foreclosed when you don't have the insurance, when you don't get to choose where I'm going to receive that care. Mm -hmm. I think for me, if I may just add one more point, the other takeaway, and it's gonna be a recurrent theme as we go forward is um, years and years ago, Rona Bartlestone said something to me that I've always remembered that a good care manager doesn't try to do everything themselves. Um, that it, 
I think what our gift is that when we look at and assess a whole situation, um, we see that there's a need for bringing in a financial planner or an elder law attorney, and that you know it's like it's like you can't play baseball with one player. You have to have a team of nine players and everybody has a different position and a role to play. And so I was fortunate that Stephanie's first reaction after hearing him was to say, you need to speak to a care manager. Uh, I can do this, but a care manager can do this. And, and you know, and I urge, e even in facilities where, you know, a family comes in and sometimes uh, you want to be all things to that family, they're inquiring about placement and things like that. Certain situations, I think it's appropriate to say, you know, this is somebody that you might want to talk to if you're struggling with decisions or you think that mom might have a difficult time settling in. Doesn't take away from what the facility can do for the new resident and the family, but some families need a little bit more. So let's go on to the second. All right. So I think we all recognize it takes a village and that's the reason to work as a team. In case study two, we have a client who intentionally planned. So here the client was actually the adult daughter of the elder. Her mother was a widow in her early 80s. And her mother had been living alone in another county in South Florida. But the daughter, based upon visits and telephone conversations, soon realized that there was some cognitive impairment occurring. And thankfully, her mother had gone to an attorney. She had both estate planning documents, a will and a trust, as well as what we refer to as incapacity planning documents. So she had the durable power of attorney, as well as the designation of healthcare surrogate. The reason that the adult child contacted me was that she saw in the documents that she was the fiduciary, the trusted person named to make the medical as well as the financial decisions, but she didn't know how to use the documents. And at the time that she called my office, she had realized that week that her mother had become a victim of several financial exploitation scams, both over the telephone, um, mail being sent where she was writing checks, thinking that by writing the checks, she was gonna win a lottery. And so there was a lot of risky behavior that she quickly identified as creating that opportunistic environment for her mother to be the perfect victim. So the role that I have initially played in this family is to educate the daughter as to what steps need to be taken under each legal document so that her authority would be recognized. And for each document, it's a little bit different. So for the designation of healthcare surrogate, we needed to get a statement by the mother's treating physician that she's unable to give informed medical consent. As to the trust document, we needed two physicians who had met with and evaluated the mother to agree that based upon their assessment, the mother was not able to properly handle her financial affairs and, and exercise good judgment. Now, I will share with you that I was pleasantly surprised because in many situations, it can take weeks to get doctors on board. Um, and that's when we're not in a pandemic. So I was anticipating that that time frame might be doubled or tripled given everything that's going on that um, doctors are tending to do telehealth meetings rather than meetings in person with their patients. Um, but we were very fortunate here, and especially with advice and guidance of Chris being a medical advocate, it literally took maybe under two weeks to get all these um, statements from the physicians in order to allow the daughter's authority to be activated. 
So we were very fortunate to have very quick success in this situation. And as a result of the daughter now standing in her fiduciary position under the power of attorney in the trust, she's able to turn that spigot off to the faucet, meaning that now she can stop any further financial exploitation from occurring. And with Chris's guidance, Chris is now going to walk us through how she is helping this family to make sure that the mother gets the proper diagnosis and treatment plan, as well as to create a residential plan. So this was this was a great situation um, to get involved with. It, it was a daughter that um, it is a daughter that was self-employed, single, um, had her own life here in Fort Lauderdale, very busy, very active, and you know from the get-go it was a combination of this is my obligation to my mother to be here in my mother's kitchen packing up her stuff because I can't leave her here, but I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing and I don't know what I'm going to do when we get in the car and drive home to Fort Lauderdale. And I remember talking to her, hearing her crunching the papers as she was packing boxes and she had the phone under her chin. And that's how our relationship started with her feeling overwhelmed, scared, angry um, and just not sure of what she was doing and had no knowledge of what dementia looked like, like didn't understand anything. So through phone calls, again, it was a, a, a process of bonding with her, empathizing with her, really listening to her and, and um, validating how she was feeling and beginning the education process about the behavior she was seeing and the things her mom was saying. And also really reinforcing that what she was doing was the right thing. She couldn't leave the mom there any longer. She was going to have to bring the mom home and that together we were going to get through it. I've never met these people. I, they've been home now for like four months, I think, or three months. We've never met, but we talk all the time. And we've gone from getting the physician appointments that I was able to arrange so she would have the documents. Um, we, uh, she, The daughter knew right away that at first she thought her mom could go to an assisted living facility. And we talked about it. We talked about her mom's behaviors. There was a lot of potential for wandering. Um, so we had to talk about memory units. And she was very scared that we were gonna be dumbing down to her mother, that somehow her mother was gonna deteriorate further by putting her in a memory unit. And we talked about safety. We talked about programs in facilities. We talked about what it's like during COVID to be in a facility. I mean, everything had to be really laid out for her to examine. And every phone call was like, I never thought of that. This is so helpful. I'm learning so much. And then she started to do her own research. She started to visit facilities. Either it was a virtual tour or she, I think she got to see one one facility and she started to make her own little lists of priorities and all the pros and cons and um, she was getting very involved she was feeling more competent but she was also feeling like she had lost her life and that she had lost her whole personal life and I started to say to her you know this is this is a marathon this is this isn't just a sprint and you've got to take care of yourself because with COVID, you're not going to have a quick admission. There's a whole process. So I encouraged her to start thinking about what were the things that she really wanted to do for herself. And she began to use one of our caregivers. We identified one caregiver who consistently went for four hours. It was never more than that. But when she needed time to get out of the house, when she wanted to go for a bike ride on a Saturday, I told her, just do it because you have to you have to take care of yourself if you're going to keep giving to your mom and you're going to need the energy for everything that lies ahead and it's worked out really beautifully she texts me in the morning these are when i need somebody um, we talk frequently and she has made a decision the mom will be placed um, mom can afford where she's going um, which was again a, part of the fiduciary 
um, responsibility was that she knew her mother had a lot of money. And so she really did want to use it appropriately and just started using it a lot sooner. But um, it was, again, how, how you support somebody and educate them and help guide them down a path that they never thought they'd have to be on. And we were fortunate that she had so many good documents already in place. We weren't starting from scratch. I agree. It made the process so much easier for her as well as the team that has been supporting her and her mom during these last few months. So it definitely takes a village. And I think it was Hillary Clinton that coined that phrase and became the title of a book that she wrote. So when we talk to, to people about the importance of planning for long-term care, there's a couple of steps that Chris and I suggest. And the first step is to explain the importance of working with an elder law attorney to become educated on how to have what can be very difficult conversations with our loved ones. It could be our parents, could be our in-laws, could even be our spouse because you know, incapacity can happen at any time, at any age. Many times it comes unexpected. So learning how to have the conversation early enough leaves people with that open window of opportunity to get documents in place, understand what planning options are, and start to work with other members of the team who can help them prepare. Mm -hmm. the, the second step that we suggest is to have a care management consult because that helps people to identify not just the present problems, but what could become future problems that could and should be avoided. The care manager is going to be able to help them identify present as well as future needs and concerns, create that plan of care, and as Chris was stressing in our second scenario, is to provide tips for caregiver self-care. You know, that's really what brings balance to people's lives, is to help them remember that in giving to others, we have to not forget or ignore giving to ourselves. We have to replenish the well. And because we're multifaceted individuals, that well consists of many different needs, physical, emotional, psychological, social. And as much as we might say, where am I going to get 10 or 15 minutes to take out of the day? I've got to cook. I've got to clean. I've got to take care of my parent or my husband. It's so important to remember and to give people tips for self-care. And I think that's one of the most wonderful things I've seen Chris do over the years that I've worked with her on behalf of mutual clients is to remind them. And, and sometimes people don't think of what are self-care habits. And Chris has come up with some wonderful ideas that help people get that feeling of being grounded again when they have that experience that life is kind of happening around them and to them and might feel like it's spinning out of control. So giving people that ability to feel grounded brings that sense of clarity so that when they meet with the financial advisor or they're meeting with the care manager or they're meeting with the residential advisor, they're really able to take in more information because they're more clear. Step three is to suggest that any existing medical advance directives be reviewed. Sometimes people write their medical advance directives, they put them away, and 10, 15, or 20 years goes by. Medical technology has advanced, but they haven't updated their advance directives. So this is definitely something we want people to consider because it becomes that tool for the surrogate to know what does my loved one want as much as what does my loved one not want when it comes to care and treatment. It's also important to take out and review any long-term care insurance policies 
because that is going to play a part in the work that Chris and I do, but especially when Chris is trying to create that plan of care, she has to know what are the resources available that are gonna pay for that care. And Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit about how we wanna set realistic expectations, but they're very much tied into what are the financial resources? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that uh, I know that at Senior Bridge, what we, you know, we actually approach that um, on two different levels. Our, um, our business executives certainly are, are providing information to families and, and potential clients about, th they're really the ones that try to ascertain what are the assets, not so much the assets, but what benefits do you have? Do you have a long-term care uh, policy that might be able to pay for care? Because care is expensive. It's not an inexpensive venture to sit down and start to talk about what is it gonna take to help someone stay at home or uh, move into a facility. And so um, I know at our company, we even have a designated person who, you know, at no cost to the families goes over the long term care policies and really helps them understand how can they utilize the policy and to their advantage. And then for me, it's just a natural conversation. I, you know, I think customer service and listening to people creates um, a need to be sensitive to the fact that there may be a very obvious need for care or for services and how are we going to make this happen and to not be afraid to talk about money to not be afraid to talk about costs and things like that I, I think it all of us who sit with families are in a position to lend ourselves and to use ourselves in a realistic way that this isn't, perhaps it is a crisis that's brought us together. It's an unexpected turn of events, or it is part of long-term planning. We have to lay all the cards on the table to know in what direction can we go, what makes most sense, both short-term and long-term. And Chris, if you would share with everybody step four. Well, I mean, to us, the value of a care manager is is many things. Uh, you know, I'm an advocate, I'm a navigator, I have a great knowledge of community resources that I've, I've learned over the years. Um, how I use myself and how I try to bring out the best in a situation to create a feeling of homeostasis at home. Um, you know, it's very hard for people to accept changes in medical conditions, changes in cognition. So you you know we're we're trying to in a way we've got many different pieces of a puzzle and I think a care manager has the ability to understand the medical, the clinical, the psychosocial, the financial, the family um, the family component and we try to basically help people feel like they're still in control of their lives even when they're feeling that they have no control, that something has happened and this isn't the life I thought I was going to have. It's not what I expected. And I think that our role is to, to help people feel that we can come to a resolution, a win-win for everybody. It's almost like mediation. How do we come to a point where people's needs are being met, people aren't feeling overburdened, and life does have to go on at a certain point. Well said, Chris. So now we'd like to talk a little bit about how we might face the challenges that COVID-19 has placed on long-term care planning. And Chris is going to lead us through these steps. So, I mean, let's face it, I think all of us, we all have very different, we're all involved in caring for seniors and, and meeting families. So COVID has just presented such a, a challenge, but yet I think people are learning that they have to use themselves differently. We're educating families, we're meeting with families in a different format, we're talking to families. And, and of course, sometimes, what brings a family to us or a new client 
is a hospitalization or the, a pending hospitalization. Granted, we are all trying to keep people out of the hospital right now, and hospitals are emptying their units because they don't want people to stay too long. But when we do have clients that are hospitalized, of course, our role always is to go into the hospital and advocate on the scene and talk to nurses and, you know, look at records and things like that. Now we have to do it in a little bit more of a convoluted way. But again, I think it's the persistence of the care manager and the commitment of the care manager that says to a case manager, you know, I'm, I'm representing a family. They, they want me to get as much information as possible. I need to coordinate the discharge plan with you. I need to understand what the client is going to need once they come home. Um, and I, I think that's hard for families to do long distance. They're never calling at the right time. So I think that our experience as care managers allow us to know how to manipulate a situation, but also get the best outcomes for our clients. And, you know, I would share along what Chris just talked about is it's been very challenging in my profession as an elder law attorney since the quarantine began. And we've actually gone through about three to four different phases of how to help clients who had no legal documents actually implement legal documents. Mm -hmm. And so where we are now in my practice is I meet with clients virtually as we're doing today through GoToMeeting. And if they do need legal documents, we prepare them. We then either mail or email them to the client. And we then have a second video meeting to go through the documents together, make sure that the client understands them, that their questions are answered. And so they understand what to expect at the time of the signing. So nothing is a surprise. Now, we've changed from where we first started four months ago, where we were sending clients to go to the drive through window at banks to get documents witnessed and notarized. From there, we were working out in the parking lot of the building, um, doing long distance signings. That was very interesting, especially when the weather didn't cooperate with us. And now we're at a new stage where we are having clients come into the lobby of the office suite and they are staying on one side of the glass window wearing a mask using hand sanitizer and a pen that they will take home with them with my staff and i being on the other side of the glass so as chris mentioned it's an opportunity and a time for all of us to think outside the box to be more creative and to find ways that we can help our clients through this challenging time. Chris, step three. Well, I, I, I think all the all the, the people that work in placement should weigh weigh in on this because um, I, I you know I'm on the outside looking in. I just know that um, it's very hard for a family to think about placing their loved one and not being able to see them for two weeks after they place them. Um, that That's a real, imagine what that must feel like. Um, um, so I think that, you know, I like to maintain really healthy and, and productive relationships with a lot of people that work in different facilities because I'm able to explain when people know me they know that I'm going to give them the best assessment of what this person is like and what's important to the family and and I share that with people that um, are experts in the facilities to give them a head start in a way but the, the issue of, of talking about placement, when can someone be placed, what will it be like when they are admitted and they have to stay in their room and who will be assigned to, you know, look out for them, that, that's a whole nother world. And I think that it just takes a lot of expertise and experience. So I tip my hat to those people who are doing it. Um, I know that the role that I can play is just to, to try to give as close of a virtual snapshot of my client and of what the family needs in order to play matchmaker, because that's kind of what it is. 
we, we try to play matchmaker by um, hoping that the, the referral will be a, a sound one and that the facility will be exactly what the family is looking for. Chris, step four. Uh, yeah, so um, so all of our work now, uh, you know, as care managers is talking. We're talking a lot. We're visiting less, obviously. Um, you know, we're calling our families. We're calling our caregivers. We're calling our clients on a regular basis. We're doing FaceTime visits. Very challenging for us to take on new clients and never have met them. So my nurse partner and I are, are doing FaceTime visits where we can um, put a name with a face because when you think about it, the emotional support that we can offer people and the, the feeling of that they can trust us comes that's part of being in a relationship and when you're just a name you're you're just a name uh, i think that our families and our clients connect with us and feel that they can trust us and count on us when they can when they can see us and so you know we have to use ourselves as i keep saying in a different way and use whatever tools we have to be able to connect with people and give them a sense of hope and continuity and and just you know, say what, do what we say we're going to do. I think consistency is very important. And helping families. I I, I had a client celebrating his hundredth birthday, um, just in July, and you know that was a birthday that the two children were looking forward to. They must have talked about that hundredth birthday for three years to me, and now they couldn't. You know, they weren't even able to be here, and it, it just broke their hearts. So, you know, helping people accept what they cannot change it's like the serenity prayer you you can't there are certain things we cannot change but how do we get through it what can we substitute what can we do um and and i think that we all do that in different ways because we're all challenged and we're challenged in our own personal life and and what we would wish we could do and then we we have the empathy for what other people are going through so um it's all we can do <laughs> For now. So we invite you and hope that all of you will become strategic partners with Chris and myself because without you, we can alone help clients navigate and interpret the legal and the healthcare system. It really takes a village to help people achieve their goals, get them grounded, and feeling balanced once again. So we hope that you'll walk away with these three takeaways today. The first one being the importance of creating that estate and incapacity plan. And that if the client does not have a legal plan and is at a stage where they lack capacity, that we can offer them guardianship because that can take a few weeks absent an emergency to put into place. So we want people to be aware of what is involved with a guardianship as soon as possible. So being able to manage a loved one's financial affairs or manage medical decisions doesn't have to be put on hold. And the third takeaway is that all of us can provide value added benefit to the people that we serve when we collaborate, because then we're able to meet more of the needs of the clients as well as their families that are also affected by what they're experiencing. So at this time, Chris and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has. You're welcome to unmute your microphone or if you prefer to write a question in the chat box, I can read the question so everybody can hear it. Chris, I would like to have your, this is Robin, I'd like to have your contact information um, because as far as placement, uh, it is very difficult um, for everybody involved because we get very involved and really try to hold their hand and walk them through the process. 
Um, you're hundred percent correct. People are hesitant to place their loved ones into assisted living now because they know that they can't visit them and we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, I have some families who are living with their children and that becomes an issue. So then we need to provide home health or right. care management. So I, I definitely agree. I agree. It, Stephanie, it takes a huge village to to do all of this. We've got great partners in assisted living, um, but it's just so difficult, and it's it's uncharted waters at this point. It really, um, I think for all of us. Yeah, I think we're getting better at it. Like when you think about how it was back in March, where you know, yeah, we didn't know anything what we were doing. Um, I think we have gotten better, but it, it's still. Um, it's still heartbreaking and it's not the way we like to do things. You know, we're all, we personalize everything we do and now we have to do it through a phone or through a text or this. So it, listen, we, we can't be too hard on ourselves. We're doing the best we can. And Correct. I agree. So, and we, when we support each other, we can bring out the best in each other. So I'd be happy to share my information. How would you like me to get in touch with you, Robin? Um, my, you can send my direct email or Leslie has my information. Okay, I'll get it from Leslie. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate what yeah. you said. Thank you. Thank you for your question and, and what you contributed, Robin. Um, probably in the next day or two, Leslie and I will reach out to everybody and we mm -hmm. will share contact information for myself and Chris as well as the attendees. And we will provide you with the link for today's recording. Um, Robin, if you'll go ahead and mute your microphone. Stephanie, I think you might have wanted to say something. I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, both of you. Very, very interesting information. Um, uh, for us, uh, as a new provider in the marketplace, um, not being open yet, we, uh, we've had the luxury of actually touring families so they can come in the building and deposit, which has been wonderful. Um, but once we open on Monday, August 3rd, we will no longer allow um, to physically tour people. So we'll have to convert to virtual tours. But, um, but one, one thing I wanted to mention is, of course, as I'm sure some of the other providers on the call, we, we do have family members that are out of state and uh, they're trying to navigate Chris and Steph the you know, the best way to, um, to, to find a good place for their loved one and also kind of sift through all of these these uncertain aspects of moving a loved one in. We've been fortunate. Um, I think because we're new and we hadn't been open yet, we're seeing a lot of folks feeling comfortable with moving into our buildings. We're not seeing any resistance right now, but where, um, where we might need your services, obviously, is the long distance relationships. Um, so, so let me just say, and I appreciate what you're saying, and I should have thought of that, I would say the majority of our family members of our clients over the years have all been out of state, some even international. So, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, I've always said customer service is somewhat a thing of the past. <laughs> when you call Com when you call Comcast, you know, you know they don't know what that means. But for us who take care of people, the easiest thing you can do is to just communicate consistently with people that have reached out to you. And that means, you know, you don't end your day until you give somebody an update by the end of the day or you call somebody when you say you're going to call them. And it, 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 it's just so important to make people feel valued because they are so far away. I would do that for anybody, even if you lived around the block. But if you're counting on me, then I want you to feel that you can count on me and that I'm going to give you the answers to your questions and be available to you. And that for me is weekends. It can be evenings. I mean, you have to be available to people because this is just such a crazy time with time zones and stuff. So I agree with you. And I, I wish you a lot of luck with your opening. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing. I'm going to check the chat box and see if there are any other questions. Does not look like there are any other questions. So I want to thank both Leslie and Chris 
for co-presenting with me and I'd like to invite everybody to join me tomorrow at 1230 for my webinar, How Elder Law and Special Needs Attorneys Help People Diagnosed with Chronic Illnesses Such as MS, Lou Gehrig's Disease, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. You can go to my website to the events page to register and receive the link. And as I mentioned, Leslie and I will reach out to everybody and share contact information as well as the recording. So please continue to take good care of yourselves, be that role model that we all need to be for the people we serve, stay healthy, and have a great safe week. Bye everybody, thank you.